Uh, it's a new one we was learned here a couple weeks ago in the gym there. Six fifteen. Let's try it. I guess. <coughs> Good morning, brothers and sisters, and the family of God who's online uh, joining us today. Blessings uh, to you as well. Yeah, there's one song that uh, that we sang here: uh, "God of Grace and, and God of Glory." That one uh, line in here, that one sentence: "Cure thy children's warring madness, bend thy pride." To die control. That about it. That just about uh, uh, sums up 
our uh, 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 Christendom today. Just uh, fighting each other over nothing. And while the devil is having a heyday because of nothing. And we should uh, take example of this. And yes, I want to talk about today, uh, you know, the, the other rites they have a, a tradition before Easter. They relay the, the book of uh, Exodus, the, when um, the, children, the children of Israel, their ordeals they had in Egypt, whatever happened to them when they left. We, uh, we have about four hours, right? No, I'm just kidding. Well, we know that the story quite well. But I, will, I want to touch on um, when they came to the, the river of uh, the Red Sea. Sorry, yes, when, the, when they came to the Red Sea. I want to focus on that story today. Uh, for these are teaching moments of, uh, of why they, they, they pass on this uh, tradition to our people there. Of, uh, I, I, now I understand why they did it uh, when you're young, just uh, tradition and so forth. But uh, hey, it's, it teaches us to be thankful and uh, grateful. But I think most of all, as we go through that today, is uh, how about we focus on character? I think most of all, that is the most important thing about this whole <coughs> This whole chapter. But before we go into this, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day that you've uh, given us, Lord. We thank you for the brothers uh, and uh, that you've uh, put into our lives to challenge us to onto a higher walk. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to deliver us, who came to this earth to show us the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you will bless this event today, that you will bless the, the words that come out from our heart, from our mouth, mouths and hearts, Heavenly Father, so that they may uh, be fruitful and multiply. Thank you, Lord God. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, let's focus on character. Moses, confidence and strength. We can see here working in the framework of God's uh, authority is far greater than any earthly king's wealth, influence, and authority. Uh, when Moses, when he worked with Aaron, uh, the signs and wonders, and most of all, God's authority was proclaimed. And look at the character of uh, Pharaoh, pride and arrogance, my way or the highway. One of the prime examples is when Pharaoh decided, foolishly, his pride and ego is far superior than God. And of course Moses, showing us by the plagues of the crossing of the Red Sea, that God is far greater than him. In everything he can possibly think or do, God was always ten steps ahead of him. When we start this journey... We should count the cost. Know yourself and know your enemy. Most of all, we should know whose we are and who we belong to. When the angel of death uh, came through, they identified themselves by the blood on the doorposts. For Jesus Christ is the King of Kings who we belong to for our battles. For the battles under his banner are a guaranteed win. But, but as we see, the journey begins in Egypt with a whisper that a Savior is coming. Just looked at uh, the, 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 um, the, the excitement that they had, <clears throat> the promises, the believing, the purpose, the faith, that action is commenced and going forth from Egypt. And let us read from in, in Exodus 14. Turn, let's turn to Exodus 14, verse 10. We'll start. And that very much goes uh, together with our studies, our Bible, our, our Bible studies we did with, uh, with the brothers in, in, the, in the coffee room there. It goes very well together. 
uh, these examples and the character, the characteristics of men. Let's start Exodus 14, verse 10. <clears throat> and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marching after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children, children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? I often wonder, God did a great work while they were in Egypt, but once they're out of Egypt, all of a sudden, God is far from their minds. He can't do miracles no more. And just look at the character of these people. That's quite something. It's not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the, the Egyptians, for it has been better for us to serve the, the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. <clears throat> and Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which we will show to you today for the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. What a promise for them. That's all a shadow of things for us, that we should take heed and take uh, hold of these uh, promises as well. And the Lord cried unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Seest unto the children of Israel that they go for, forward, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go unto dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, and I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh. And upon all his hosts, whom his chariots, and, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of, the God, and the angel of God went up before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came before between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave them light by night to, to these, so that the one came not near the other at all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and unto their, unto their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the, to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horsemen, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning, in the morning, watch, and it came to pass that in the morning, watch the Lord. In the morning watch, the Lord looked on to the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off the chariot weeds and they drave them heavenly. So, they, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the sea, that the waters may come again unto the Egyptians upon their ch chariots. And upon the horsemen, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to the strength, to his strength. When the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled across it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh, and came on to the sea after them. They there remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall. And the, <clears throat> and the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel this day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the, the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. 
And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. See, that is quite a story of being delivered with great power, physical power, from the hand of God. That should have set them for life from, from coming out of Egypt to the, going to the promised land and to the wilderness. But we know how men are. There's this one story about a Greek uh, general named Pyrrhus. He remarked after winning, uh, winning a battle with the Romans, he said to his uh, general, to his uh, officer, if we are, if we are victorious, victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we shall be utterly ruined. Hence the term Pyrrhic victory, defining such a devastating toll on the victor that is, a, that is a tantamount to defeat. And there's another term, is winning the battle but losing the war. Pharaoh, he should, have, he should have quit while he was ahead in Egypt. But he couldn't. His pride and his character. Like in, uh, in the Proverbs 18.12, there's a verse, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is uh, humility. And that is what we should... Uh, Take heed of. So we see that pressing forward in the Christian life is as important as crossing the Red Sea. We see many, many wonderful examples in this chapter. The fear of the Egyptian army activated our fear and faith in God. Our Savior to hasten the journey that we are on. The opposition that they faced was a blessing in disguise, strengthening those muscles that were needed on that journey. That is how we... Uh, that is in our journey as well. The opposition and uh, uh, verbal abuse and the physical abuse that we face and will face eventually. That is just strength for our spiritual body, uh, our spiritual journey. Now in saying this, doesn't this sound all too familiar when we look at our lives as an individual or as a whole? The lack of faith, distrust and fear in fact. And fear. In fact, the whole journey of Egypt to the Promised Land is profoundly predicts and depicts the journey of a Christian from the new birth, the baptism, the wilderness journey, and the Promised Land to church. These five points sum up our journey as a believer and are uniquely necessary and must be experienced in these steps as listed. For you, for we can't face the giants of the Promised Land unless the wilderness journey has been completed. Our church life, unless all has been conquered, for the greatest enemy is the one within. For the giant of self can sometimes be a giant of a problem when, when we come to church. And most of all, in Philippians, one of my favorite verses, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, If there therefore be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy and be ye like-minded. Having the same love, being one accord and the one mind. I think most of all, that's what the Lord God has intended for the Israelites when he took them out of Egypt and he brought them to their promised land. To be one, to show God his law and his mercies to the nations around him, that he is far superior, that he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And that is for us as well in, in the New Covenant Church, that uh, the greatest thing we can do is to, uh, after all the battles, and there are still battles to be won, no doubt, but is that we, show, that we may show to our enemies into the spiritual realm, God's enemies, for the thing that grieves God, that should grieve us as well. That we are far more powerful in him and through him. Bless you, brothers. Thank you. Thank you, brother.
for, yeah, the reminder. Look at the pride in Pharaoh's heart. How he just, God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. But you know what? God doesn't need to harden that heart. When a man is is overtaken by pride, he will follow that pride until he's right to the ground. Till he's, till he's uh, lowered and sometimes a snake's belly. And that's a human being. Because when he justifies something, when he, when he holds hold on to something, he will just continue to pursue it and pursue it until he has completely um, destroyed himself. And that's what happened with, with, uh, with King Pharaoh. How easy it is to rely on ourselves, to think we are more than we are, we're bigger than we are. The proud he is able to humble. And we need to, you know, our, our, our heritage cherished these stories. These stories of uh, Israel coming out of the wilderness, the, the story of Joseph and uh, Jacob, Joseph and his brothers, the captivity, uh, the four hundred years captivity, and the Exodus. That story was faithfully uh, repeated every single year, and uh, we have a whole generation who doesn't know about that here. Might be good to one of those days dive into that. Beautiful reminder, most of all of God's faithfulness, more than anything else, and that He actually can work with people in spite of their, their, um, their feelings, in spite of their weakness, in spite of their stupidity. He actually can choose to work with us. That's a comfort to me. That's a comfort to us all, that He can and He will use us. All He, all he wants for us is a, a willing mind and a, willing, and a desire. To, uh, to pursue that, those amazing truths in his word. Brothers and sisters, I, uh, I want to continue my series. I was thinking of some of a little bit again on coming back from a short trip to the U.S. I was again, as always, there's a burden. A burden comes on our heart for God's people and for unity to become among God's people and his, his kingdom to be advanced. But uh, there's, uh, there's going to be a time. There's, a time is coming where more clarity will come and, uh, and the, the message will be more profound for, uh, when that time arrives. But there is a call in the land for God's people to unite. There is a call for God's people to turn once again to the source of their lives and the source of hope. It's, it's, it's such a disarray, everything. It's... The enemy is, 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 he's on offense. And we need to fight back. We need to stand on the truths we've, we've received. We can't let ourselves be shaken or moved by what the enemy does. We can't let ourselves be, be um, even um, perturbed. Because we know his end. We know the outcome. We win if we stand in his truths and in the gap. We are guaranteed victory. And that's the truth we need to stand in, be established in, and walk in. And that's part of my purpose in this life. That's to unapologetically preach the Word of God. In season or out of season. To, uh, to, uh, uh, divide, to rightly divide God's Word. And when we do that, we can be assured that we're going to be stepping on some people's toes. We can be assured that we are going to go against the culture that we live in. We can be assured that the enemy will not like it. That should not move us. That should not cause us to even skip a beat. In fact, it should empower us to know That we are on the side of the King of Kings. We have no right as children of God and me as a pastor 
to be, a, to be the judge of Scripture, but rather to be a student of Scripture. His Word needs to define us, guide us, teach us not the cultural norms, not what's popular, not what has and not you and, uh, and, and, and unapologetically and not a fear, not interfere with God's authority of Scripture and, and the word he's left behind uh, for us here. Because I'm convinced, as many of you are, that God has provided a plan for man. And that plan is the blueprint and the superstructure for our lives, our personal walk with God, our families, our marriages, our communities, and our societies. There, there is a superstructure. There's a plan that we need to follow. And when we do, we are guaranteed, as I said, to get the results that he has, that he said we could, we could have. And so again, my, my job is to brightly divide the word of truth, and that's what I want to do again today. I'm moving on to message number 15 in this series on rightly dividing the word of truths. And this one here today is what we believe concerning the role of women in the church. Last time we talked about the men, so sisters, you're not escaping this gauntlet either. The word of the Lord has just as much to say on you, to you as it does to the men. And I'm not here to make arguments, but to love the word Live the word, preach the word, and God takes care of the rest. God is in charge of the outcome. He's in charge of the results. Because in my last message on male headship, I, I spoke of how the men should be the leaders, how they should lead with love and compassion, and first of all, learn how to lead themselves, learn how to, to walk humbly with their God, and take their responsibility and calling in life seriously. And as a result, as, uh, we, we spoke as a result, the sisters will naturally follow along. I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say most sisters will naturally follow along. At least most godly sisters will. But there's always exceptions to every rule. Therefore, the Bible has given us the teachings for sisters as well not just for the men. Male headship is a hot-button topic in our liberal world here, and so is the role of women. It's probably more than a, a hot-button, it's probably a powder keg in the, in the, in the Western liberal, liberal world and in the feminist society that we, we live in where women have uh, rule and have uh, basically upended the order of God and um, when you look at scriptures, you can see uh, when I go through some of those scriptures today, you'll see that uh, for, for those verses, I could, we could say there's a lot of them on there that, that would be on the feminist hit list. Verses that the feminist world would love to eradicate out of God's word or ev eradicate altogether. So... Uh, where are we here in all this? If we look, if we look at the God's word, before I, I'm just going to be reading two passages here uh, in a minute. Um, even though in our in our in our circle here we have um, male headship, the role of women is, is pretty well established. It's pretty pretty deeply ingrained in our culture, in our way of life, because we've grown up with it. We've we're used to it, and and we've actually. We've actually allowed the pendulum to swing a little bit in the other direction where we've actually uh, given more freedom to the sisters and allowed the sisters to be more themselves and allowed them to, to, to be ex expressive and, uh, but, under, but still under, be under authority. Um, there are still the truths of scriptures that cannot be overlooked nor can they be disregarded. They need to be taught as ultimate authority. We have 
so many views on this topic that uh, sometimes it's hard to even put it together in a way that, the, that, that uh, follows a logical order, but I'm going to try. We want to stay in the middle of the road. We want to honor our sisters, but at the same time provide a safe environment, recognize their potential, but also, but, at, but without apologies, adhere to the unchanging word of the living God. So I want to read two passages here uh, this morning that allude to the role of women and lay out God's agenda when it comes to this topic. And again, I'm going to go to Hebrews, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the one on the head covering, although we're not talking about the head covering today or modesty. We're talking of just simply about the role of the sisters. And we'll also look at a verse in Titus. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, we'll start at verse 7 to 12. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 7 to 12. And here Paul lays out to the Corinthians the, the, the order of God, the order in which he ordained society, ordered society, and showed us how a society will flourish and, and receive all the blessings from God. For a man ought, indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. I think Paul was confusing himself here. But Paul writes to a culture that is very similar to Canada and the United States, to Western civilization. He was not talking to a Jewish culture. And we notice this because Jesus never once spent time in his ministry talking about the role of women. He left it up to Paul and Peter. Because he knew they would, they would, they would uh, uh, encounter and engage cultures that were not like the Jewish culture. The Jewish culture had it was very much like the Hutterite culture. Very religious, very traditional, and they kept their women in subjection. <laughs> They didn't let him breathe. There was very, it was, it, was, it was rules, 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 and they were defined. And, and, you know, and our Anabaptists are also defined by that. You know, I was a couple of young brothers here from two Mennonites here a few months ago, and uh, I asked them what, is, what defines their church from other Mennonite churches in their area. They, 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 were, they called themselves a, they were a kind of a more evangelistic uh, church. And I asked them, what, what, are, what, are some, what would you say defines your church or, or, or makes your church unique from the, the church down the street? And he said, well, just like all of us do, you know, we, most of our churches are defined by how the women dress. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I got a problem with that. But... Uh, Although that's included in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in church life, that is not what defines the role of women. No, it doesn't. So uh, there's another, the other passage I want to look at here before we come back is uh, Titus chapter 2, 1 to 5. Here, he's, Paul gives another role of women here. But speak, Titus 2, chapter, one, Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, he says to Titus, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, Keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. 
So in these two passages we see both the, the position of women in the headship order and the role of women in their order. And those are two powerful uh, statements made by Paul as he taught Gentiles and nations that were not of Jewish heritage how to align their lives and their churches according to God's word. Jesus, um, I touched on it here before, but Jesus, when he walked on earth, he, didn't, he did not address these issues, but he actually elevated the women. In the, in the Gospel of Luke, you could see he paid special attention to sisters and honored them and showed them. Uh, uh, and he was, he was attempting to teach that culture that these sisters are persons too. They have value, they are, they are important, and they have a very special role in my kingdom and in my, in my uh, chain of command and in my administration. They have an extremely important role, uh, one that we cannot, absolutely cannot, uh, uh, not only overlook, but we, we cannot downplay it. It is, it is, uh, it is so, so vital to the sustaining of a church and a people that um, many times we take it for granted. So in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 here, when Paul talks of man and the woman, he is, he is defining the headship order. He is defining how God placed man, uh, Christ first, then the man, then the woman. And he clearly states out that God made man. God made woman for man. Not to be his, uh, not to be stepped on, not to be his uh, slave, but a help me, just as I said in the beginning, to complete him, not to compete with him. A help me suitable for him. Someone who fulfills the amazing design of family and of societies. Who, someone who, who, can, who fills that part of the order of society that will cause God to pour out his blessings on a people. That's all that Paul was trying to explain here in, in that uh, chapter 11 here. And when he said, For man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And as I said in my last message, that when men, when, when women, the feminist movement has done to women, it has put them in the spotlight and and uh, uncovered them and uh, done all those bad things to women that they robbed them of their dignity and their personhood and all that stuff. It, it becomes, it, the, the pages have flipped and men worship the creature rather than the creator. They began worshiping the woman and that has resulted in a society that has absolute disdain for the family, for family values and even children become a burden to society when that order is turned on its head. So most of this here today is not strange to us as we as a church have a lot of those things in order, but a young generation is coming up that uh, has been liberated and so they might need to be realigned a little bit from time to time because uh, they love their freedoms. When we look at uh, a Muslim culture, we can clearly see the other extreme, an extreme religion. We can see the other extreme, how that is against God's will. That is not the way God designed it. Yes, they need to be in submission and subjection, but that's not God's design. The way our Western civilization goes, that's not God's design either. I cannot agree with that either. Uh, I had a quote here. I thought I had it here, but I guess I missed it somewhere. Yeah. It has been said, women are the real architects of society. They wield a powerful influence on their men, on the men, on their men. They can shape a child's future in a profound way, and thus they can actually alter the course of a society. Boy, that's true. And so don't you, sister, don't you ever believe your role is not important just because it's in some, it, it, is in, it is after man 
in submission to man, and in uh, in God's order of Christ, man and woman, it's it's third. That doesn't mean a thing. Your role, because only authority authority is only given to people who are under authority. And so when we follow God's, God's chain of command and a woman embraces her role as a helpmeet and in that chain of command, she actually finds that she has an amazing amount of authority by God to fulfill her role and to be in her role. Just as a clear distinction, just as there is a clear distinction between the genders, so there is a clear distinction between their roles and their responsibilities. And I know that many of them can overlap when it comes to our roles, what the men can do, because men can cook too, and so can women, and we can clean. And, but, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's roles that women do that are absolutely awkward for a man, and vice versa. And there's roles women have that are impossible for men to have. So we, we, when we look at those roles, that should just fill us with awe and wonder at the amazing creativity of our Creator. At the amazing wisdom, how He made us so incredibly different. How He, he had this huge separation, so opposite, male and female. But those two together in their order, provide something absolutely precious that the angels delight to look into. And that's how he wants to bless his people. But look what we have in our society. I know I don't need to say this because we're speaking to the choir here, as the saying goes, what has happened to the West uh, when, when women were liberated in the last 50 years. They were liberated from the, from the bondages that they were supposedly in, what the, the, the feminist movement did. What did they do? They didn't just liberate them. They liberated them also from their clothes, from their dignity, from their personhood, from their roles, and even their identity. And what has that done? It has brought an absolute carnage to the family, to marriage, to homemaking, and those pillars of society that we rely on. What do we have today, women and girls? They're used like cars, traded, bought and sold. They're forced, when you watch, you can't even watch uh, women's sports. Not that we should, not that I'm advocating sports. Because they undress the women for the sports game. Men can be dressed. Women are half naked. Why is that? Because they have been demoralized and literally dehumanized. They've, they've been made into objects of lust. And that is so degrading. That is so devaluing the preciousness of the woman. That is so... And, and this culture has totally embraced this, this uh, wrong mentality. I, it's literally a perversion. And uh, what has resulted from that? Millions of men don't know how to relate rightly to a woman. They don't know how to treat them as a person, as an equal, because their minds have been corrupted by the enemy and by the body and by how uh, the woman is portrayed. And the women's minds have been polluted as well as they think body image is everything. The outward, the physical... The sensual. That's not what they're for. That's not their purpose. That's not God's plan. So when it comes to roles of women, there are four things that we find in Scripture. Uh, the, the, the four areas that Peter and Paul addressed. And one, the first one is their position in the headship order. The second is their role as a helpmeet, keepers at home. And... Uh, uh, bearing children in the families. We'll put that together in one. The third, their responsibility to be silent in the churches. And fourth, their obligation to dress modestly and be covered. We're not going to cover the last one. We'll leave that for a separate message. Uh, modesty and uh, the covering. We will look at their roles, their position in the headship order first. 
Ephesians 5, 22 to 25, it is written, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, Paul writes, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not, excuse me, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived in was in the transgression. The Bible maintains here that as sisters, they should not be in authority over men. But that doesn't make them any less valuable. And nor should they exercise authority over men. But that does not mean they do not have authority. In fact, in Romans in 1 Corinthians 11, there's actually a verse, the verse that says, for this reason ought the woman to have authority on her head, when it's talking about the covering. We'll talk about that some other time. Neither should women teach men or serve as pastors or elders in the church. This, this could look like, down, uh, uh, you know, looking down. This verse, these verses could look like Paul was a little bit snobbish. He was a little macho and egotistical. He's not. He's simply refer, saying in that in God's order, if you want a society to flourish, there are chains of command. Just like in, a, in an organization, there's, there's managers and there's uh, um, CEOs. In the church, there's elders and then there's brothers and, 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 and so forth. In, in, in businesses, in every organization, there is this chain of command. And, and all he's simply saying here, this is the chain of command in Christ's church. The value of each one of us is the same. We are valued exactly the same before God. No one is more important than the other. But the offices are different, and they are vastly different. Some argued, some have argued that, you know, God used women mightily in the Bible. As I said in the last, De- Deborah was one of them. And we even talked of Esther uh, at our devotions, and, and down through the uh, Aquila and Priscilla. And we see how many women played prominent roles in, in, in the Bible. But if we look at it, it's more an exception than a rule. And many times when he had to use a woman, it's because the men were missing. But what has happened? Modern Western civilization has glamorized office work, feminism, high heels and mini dresses. Women being liberated from the humdrum of housework and placed into meaningful positions, you know, where they walk around with a strutting a nice office bag and, and being in those prominent positions, liberating and doing something meaningful to help make the world a better place. A woman can make the world a better place in one place, and that is by embracing her role as a helpmate. And as a result of those ideals and ideas that were strutted on magazines and on television and, and everywhere in society, it's had an effect on, on, on our it's had an effect on our plain churches as well. It's had an effect on every part of the Christian movement, not only in, in the in the ungotten the godless society. And what the, and the result has been homemaking, woman's work childbearing and child rearing, housekeeping, and those related works have been looked down as dull, boring, drab, and unsexy. That's what it's been looked down as. And you know what? What a price the society has paid because of that. I know this is a crude word, but sometimes we need to draw attention to things to get people's attention. 
Because with a woman, and it's not escaped us either, it's been all about physical appeal, beauty, attraction, and glamour, careers, and freedoms. And we see it. Whole stores are dedicated to women's clothing and women's products. Entire stores. And that is to destroy the woman and further objectify her. <coughs> That's not her place. That's because it's been stepped out of God's order and the result has been devastating. She's been robbed of her identity, of her womanhood, And now we're living in a nation where a Supreme Court nominee can't even define what a woman is. Can you believe that? Someone who's supposed to serve in the highest order of government cannot define what a woman is. You should go ask a three-year-old. So... As a result of her position, she should, um, the woman should embrace submission as a virtue and not as a, as a duty, as a, oh, well, it's a bad thing. You know, that's the way it is. When a woman embraces her place, she receives authority. And the authority comes from the angels, from God himself. Why does God put that order there? Why did God put so much emphasis on, on the role of women and in, and, in the role and in the headship of men? Because, like Peter said, they're the weaker vessels. God has ordained it that way, that we men protect them, that we men don't abuse them, but protect them. Because women are more easily influenced by their emotions. They're easier to deceive, as Paul said, with uh, Adam and Eve there. She was deceived. Adam was totally disobedient. But she was deceived. And we need to be protect them from predators and perverts that prey on them in this society, in the world. Therefore, in submission, there is real strength. There is real authority. There is real power. The second role is their role as men's help meet, keepers at home, bearing children, and the family unit. Titus chapter 2, 3, and 5. I read that and I'll read it again. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Paul is saying here, We bless, the, the word of God is blasphemed when God's order is upended. When God's order is taken out of context and disorder starts reigning. When we look at that verse, Paul gives the complete uh, role of women in a few, in a few short verses. How they, how, how they are to uh, nurture and nourish the society and the church and the body of Christ. And how deep and far-reaching their influence is here. Do you sisters realize who you are? Do you sisters realize the power that you wield simply by taking your place that God created you to be? It is when women fight that place where they lose their authority, they lose their, in their, they lose their influence, and they lose their significance. When they start fighting that order, when they submit to that order, the incredible value that God has placed on woman is fully realized. And I believe it's fully, even more realized when the entire church embraces the role of woman. I think we, I'm not saying that we don't, but I think we should turn around, to, to, to turn this society around that we are living in, when I'm talking of, I'm talking of Canada, Western civilization, we must turn around and start glamorizing homemaking. Glamorizing the home, the family, childbearing, and other womanly callings that men will never be able to do. That men can't do. 
There's the role and the calling that God made for woman. Paul writes, I will therefore that younger women marry, bear children, and guide the house. Imagine life when there was no women to do all this. Now, life would cease to exist, of course. But uh, you know how men are. Well, not all men, but some men. It won't be for the women cleaning up after them. If it won't be for the women doing all those womanly roles in the background, you have no idea, ladies, sisters, how much of an impact you make. How much you, how big that role is in sustaining the church. In maintaining order, the influence that the uh, that happens underneath the surface. So as a result of her role, she must allow, uh, it's a woman's uh, responsibility to allow her man and the men to lead. She has to allow them. Men will not, generally, especially Christian men, will not force their authority on the woman. The woman needs to embrace her role. And so she, most of all, the most power she wields over with her husband is to pray for him, to love him, as, as we read in our text here, and to honor him, not by nagging or correcting or fighting with them. In Proverbs chapter, four, chapter 12, verse 4, it says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. You want to hear the second part? But she who brings shame is like rottenness to his bones. Sisters, if you set out to change your man, you will not like what you made. You will be, you will be, because a woman is a woman. She's feminine. She's made, and if you, if you want to change your man, you're going to make him feminine. And there's nothing more disgusting than to see a man that doesn't act like a man. The roles that we're so opposite. Do not try to change your man. Your job is to try to make your man into the man, to, 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 to allow God to make your man into the leader God created him to be. And so as a, as a, as a rule... Most of the time when Peter talk or, and Paul talk of, of sisters, he talks of married sisters. He, he doesn't address the single sisters. So, uh, but you can t- you can, um, you, we can apply the, the same principles. And one of the ways he says here uh, in our passage that you don't talk negatively about your husband to others. Don't dishonor your husband. Sisters, your responsibility is to make your home a haven and a place of rest. A place where the husband or the dad enjoys to come home to. Where he delights to be and spend his time. Sometimes women drive their husbands away. They manipulate them. They yell at them, they boss them around, and they treat them like little children. And then wonder why their marriage is on the rocks. And wonder why there's no love in their marriage, no oneness. And wonder why the husband doesn't take his role as leadership. Hello, it's very easy to figure out. You have to give him the role. Most men will just retract. Most men will just go back into a shell if the woman doesn't embrace her role simply as help meet. Instead of fighting with them, they will just, you will just uh, uh, retreat and then the home is in reverse. And then, it's no, then, then there's no use turning around and blaming the husband for not being there for them or their children. The Bible says it's better to, to dwell in the corner of a rooftop than with a contentious woman. I didn't say that, by the way, so don't, don't fire at me. 
God wants the sisters to see that that role, you can draw out the true leader in men by embracing the call God has for it. When the home is, that, is upended, how can children learn to respect authority? How can they learn to submit to authority? How can they learn to honor their dads when the wife and the mother does not or is in constant conflict with him? If anybody is guilty of that, my heart is, and my prayer is, that they take it to heart. Plead with God, repent, and that they give them a new heart and a new mind so that peace and unity can be restored in a home. Because I believe, I've been a father and a husband for 26 years now, I think, 26. I've learned a lot in my years. But one thing I know, if there's contention, if we, if we, we, are, we husbands can set the temperature of the homes. We set the temperature. We set the... the uh, and if we allow our pride to, be, to, to, call, to have contention in the home, it's the worst possible environment for children to grow up in. Because here on the one hand, we are proclaiming the name of Jesus. We are proclaiming His authority and His Lordship over our homes. But if, and we, the wife uh, demonstrates the church and the husband demonstrates Christ, that is marriage, as Ephesians 5 says. And when that order is, when there is conflict there, children get a mixed message of God. They get a perverse message of God. And what happens is they don't see anything wrong with blatant rebellion. They, they will blatantly and openly rebel and they will not see the error, the depth of that error, of that sin. And so it's extremely important that you understand the role as be, uh, in the headship order and then your role as a homemaker and, 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 to, and to walk in, in, in that role and embrace it. If our husbands are not taken, sisters, I'm speaking to you, leadership position not taken as his calling, as fulfilling, as, uh, and his role as a father uh, seriously enough, you need to check your hearts too if it's maybe not your fault. I know men should not take that as an excuse, but to check your heart if it's not your fault. In Proverbs 21, 19 says, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Those are hard words, sisters. And they teach all of us that God is a God of order. He's a God of love. And He wants order. And if there's no order in the home, there's no order in the church. If there's no order in a family where children are protected and nurtured and taught God's standards, it's going to be very difficult to promote Christianity to the world. It's going to be very difficult to show the world that Jesus Christ saves sinners. It's going to be very difficult to show the world how beautiful the Christian life can be. That role, sisters, needs to be embraced and taken with all seriousness. And the last one here is um, the role to be silent, the responsibility to be silent in the churches. Now, this one is very controversial. And I think it needs a little more interpretation when it comes to silence. When, when, it, when it speaks of silence, he, Paul simply means their sister's roles is not to be in authority. I'll read the verse here. 1 Corinthians 14, 13 to 37, he says. 14, 33 to 37. For God, is not an, uh, for, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in the church, or was it from you the word of the God came? Or are you the ones, the only ones it has reached? 
If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things that I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. He really, he really seems to come down hard on the women on being silent here. He seems to say, and remember, he's talking to the Corinthians, where the women were bosses, women were ruling. There was a huge, uh, the, 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 that culture was so alike, our culture today. And Paul, and they brought that culture into the church. And Paul was trying to change the culture of the Corinthians to be a biblical culture. And that's why he used some of those words here. And he even said it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. Uh, that's pretty strong. I cannot say that, uh, that, that a woman's uh, advice and counsel is not valuable. I have received countless gems of knowledge, of truth, and of pers perspective from sisters, from my wife, from even from my daughter, and from sisters in the church here. I, it, the, the silence means they do their work behind the scenes. They're like the heart and soul of the body. Behind the scenes, they do the great work. They influence. And so it's very important that women are godly because you influence men. You influence us and your children. And so when he says here, it's shameful for a woman to speak in the church, it is to do the work that I'm doing here today. To preach God's word. To usurp authority over men. That's the part that's shameful. Being silent doesn't mean she doesn't speak. They have a voice, they have an opinion, and they can impart a lot of wisdom and insight that we men often need. But it needs to be done in God's order. Sisters can be teachers in school. They can do so many things in a church. And I believe in one way, they are one of the church's most effective witnesses. Strong men will not disdain the advice of their wives, their counsel. They will listen. Even if they don't take their counsel all the time, they will value it. There's a big difference. The Bible says they are the weaker vessel. That means she is more easily broken. She is more easily hurt. She is more easily deceived. Therefore, because she is a, because she's more, the woman is more emotional and feeling-based, Therefore, it is imperative that we be there for our sisters to provide a stable environment, a brotherhood where our sisters are protected from harm so that they can truly flourish and exercise the gifts that God has given them. And to a greater or lesser degree, we're seeing this in our church. And I praise God for it. Women can clearly be leaders over women, over children. And I think in the first five years of a child's life, the woman plays a greater role than the dad, the mother. Plays a greater role. The influence can last for that child's life. So sisters, you have a powerful voice. It's just in how you engage it. You have a powerful presence. It is how you use it. In God's order, and it can have a profound effect on society and on the church. So, to close, understand your position and walk in it. Embrace your role as a helpmeet and make your home a haven of rest and a blessing to your husband and children. Allow your husbands to lead Encourage him, pray for him, and submit to him. That's God's word. When we embrace that role, you have a voice. You are heard, and you are valued and appreciated. Just like all other things in the Bible. God will honor you, and God does honor. And I'm seeing it with my open eyes, how he does. But I've also seen the other spectrum, the other end of the spectrum. So that's how God's order is to be. 
and I know there's uh, some of them are hard to to uh, to bring forward, but when we love the truth, we will also obey the truth. God bless you. To God be the glory.